Hello everyone, this is Dr. Stevens, and our lecture is Characteristics of Contemporary Lyric Poetry. This will be an introduction, and only an introduction, and hardly an introduction to the entire subject. It's a very complex subject. Uh, contemporary lyric poetry has great variety. It is very difficult to reduce the characteristics of contemporary poetry into any one list, but I'll give you uh, some idea of some of the important characteristics. Uh, before we get started, let me point out that picture there, um, the African-American poet Langston Hughes, um, one of the inventors, if you will, of contemporary uh, poetry in English. So let's get started. Uh, we, let me remind you that uh, if you want to uh, maximize the PowerPoint uh, section of your screen, you can use that Maximize uh, button in the upper right-hand corner, not of the entire computer screen, but just of the PowerPoint section. And that will give you uh, a larger view in case you're having difficulty reading everything that's on these PowerPoint slides. So. Let's get started. In this lecture, we're going to have a look at characteristics of poetry in the following categories. Form, language, subject matter, and context. And so we're going to look at these different things. Now, these are, these are just the different categories, right? Form, language, subject matter, context. These would apply to all poetry. So we're just looking at the categories and we're going to look at how form, language, and so on uh, occur, if you will, in uh, contemporary poetry. But all poetry, right from the beginning, is going to have form, language, etc. And we're going to be looking at examples as we see these in the characteristics of contemporary poetry, which is the collection that accompanies uh, this lecture. So. Um, you might want to have that out. We'll be uh, looking at it on the screen here, too. But just take note that that is something that you can refer to either now as you're watching the lecture or uh, at some other time when you're studying this subject. So we'll be going back and forth uh, in the lecture between the PowerPoint and the uh, collection called Characteristics of Contemporary Poetry. Let me warn you, though, that what we're looking at are general trends in poetry, poetry that is still being written today, and uh, most of the poets that we, are, we will look at are poets who are, who are still alive and still writing. Uh, these are general trends, and what I say is not something that applies to every single contemporary poem. There are going to be exceptions. So these are not rules. All right? These are general trends that we're going to see uh, in context, subject matter, language, and so on. So please keep that in mind as we go along. All right. Let's begin with form. In general, contemporary poetry, and this goes back to... What I'm saying here goes back to the beginnings of the modern period. Which is about 1900, very approximately. So over a hundred years ago, in the beginning of what we call the modern period, uh, these trends in form have already begun, and we see them realized then in contemporary poetry. So there is this movement from the formal toward the informal in form. And we'll, we'll see what I mean by this as we go along. From rhymed poetry to unrhymed poetry, from strict meter toward free verse, 
especially the use of the line break. And again, we'll, I'll show you what I mean by that as we go along. From the formal stanza toward the irregular stanza or toward no stanza at all, toward uh, poems that really seem to be broken more into verse paragraphs, right? And as in prose... Not all paragraphs are the same length. Um, so, in this particular case, um, either no stanza or what I'm calling verse paragraphs, that is, um, the poem might be divided into stanzas, but they're not all the same, they're not all the same length, like in verse, as in verse paragraphs. And then from conventional syntax to irregular, unconventional syntax, and even broken. That is, instead of the usual sentence structure that we find in prose, um, you might find fragments of sentences, phrases, and so on. Let's, um, let's go now, when we're talking about form, to uh, that uh, handout, Characteristics of Contemporary Poetry. And here we are toward the end. Let's go, let's go up toward to the very first poem now. This first poem in the collection, Acquainted with the Night by Robert Frost, is a contrast. This is an example of the kind of form that contemporary poetry has moved away from. Robert Frost is one of the modern poets. He died in 1963, all right, not quite 50 years ago. Um, one of the major American poets of the 20th century. But Frost, although in a lot of ways he's representative of the modern period, he used a lot of the traditional forms that contemporary poetry has moved away from. So, for example, I said we move uh, from the formal to the informal structure of a poem. And that's exactly what Frost is representing here. He represents the formal. So when I say that contemporary poetry moves away from the formal, this is what I'm talking about. So Robert Frost, Robert Frost, I have been one acquainted with the night. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the furthest city light. I have looked down the saddest city lane. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes unwilling to explain. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street, but not to call me back or say goodbye. And further still, at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right, I have been one acquainted with the night. Now you will recognize in this poem, let's see if we can get the whole thing on the screen here. You will recognize in this poem things that most people associate with poetry. First of all, the rhyme. Night, we'll call that A. Rain, we'll call that B. And then night rhymes with light, so A goes um, is repeated here at the end of that stanza, and then B is repeated here with lane, which uh, rhymes with rain, of course, and then we get another rhyme sound, and we're going to call that C, all right, because it's different from A and B, and so we got beat, but then explain goes back and rhymes with lane and rain, so we call that B, and so on and so forth. If you want to go through the whole poem here, beat, See how it's linked? See how the B rhyme <coughs> in the middle of this stanza is picked up 
um, at the end of the first line. It's in the middle of, of the first stanza, but then it's at the first line in the second stanza, and so on and so forth. So we get three line stanzas, but they're linked, right? So B links stanza one with stanza two, C links stanza two with stanza three. All right, and so cry then is going to be our D rhyme. Go back to C here. D then is going to do what? It's going to link with stanza four, and then we're going to have one last rhyme sound with height. Oh, I'm sorry. No, wait a minute. My bad. My bad. Let's erase this. Where's my eraser? Okay. Okay. Whoops. Don't do that. <laughs> that wasn't planned, so we've got... Um, there we go. So we've got A, B, A, uh, there we go again. That's C. <laughs> Wait, A, B, A. Oh. Sorry, folks. Must be too early this morning. A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C, D. And then look what happens here. We go back to A, don't we? All right? A, D, and then we're back at A again. We're back at A so that Mr. Frost then can repeat, right? Repeat his first line with his last line. Well, so we, we recognize rhyme, and we also recognize extremely formal structure here. All right, this is a very carefully planned rhyme structure, isn't it? The stanzas are linked with rhyme. Uh, we begin with one rhyme, we move away from it, we go back to it at the end, and so on. It's very easy to see what the structure is here. The same with meter. This uh, is written in iambic, iambic pentameter. It's a regular meter. It goes like this. Um, let's look at this line because this is one of the more regular ones here, but not to call me back. But not to call me back or say goodbye. These are the stressed syllables. Not call back, say goodbye. And these are, and sometimes we use this little U to indicate the unstressed. But not, so, so but and to and me and so on get less emphasis. They're not as loud, they're not as high pitched, they're not as long and so on um, as the stressed syllables. But that beat, that rhythm that you hear, but da 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 da, right? That's iambic pentameter. Ten syllables, five stressed syllables. And each line is written in iambic pentameter. I have been one acquainted with the night. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the furthest city light. I have looked down the saddest city lane, and so on. Each line is the same length. Each line uses the same general rhythm. All right? And... So that's what we mean when we say that we have a regular metrical structure or the meter of the poem is regular. We have that regular rhythm going throughout. And finally, we have the stanza structure, right? Um, three lines uh, per stanza for the first four stanzas, and then two lines, right? three, 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 three and then two. And some of you may recognize this then as a sonnet. One of the earliest, one of the oldest 
of uh, met of <coughs> excuse me lyric forms in English lyric poetry, the sonnets. Wow. And we've only just begun, and we're 15 minutes into this lecture. We have a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to move on from here. Mr. Frost's Acquainted with the Night. We're going to go, um, let's see, do we need to go back? No, I think what we'll do is we'll go on here to uh, the next poem. Notice that in our collection we're looking at poems in the uh, category form and I think that uh, we have two poems in each of the category form, language, subject matter, and context. Okay, so we move from Mr. Frost who died in uh, 1963, was born in the 19th century, in the 1800s. We move from him to Rita Dove, who is a contemporary poet, uh, born in 1952, uh, an African-American poet, um, also one of the former uh, a Library of Congress poets, that's sort of the highest position that uh, uh, that a poet can achieve in a public in the public sphere anyway in this country. We've uh, seen another um, Library of Congress poet, that was Robert Hayden uh, in an earlier lecture. If you saw that, that lecture on what's in a text and how to paraphrase and summarize a poem, we looked at the, uh, the poem of those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden, another Library of Congress uh, poet. But let's look at Heart to Heart by Rita Dove and see the contrast with Mr. Frost's uh, Acquainted with the Night. It doesn't look as though I can get the entire poem on the screen here, but we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, heart to Heart, it's neither red nor sweet, it doesn't melt or turn over, break or harden, so it can't feel pain, yearning, regret. It doesn't have a tip to spin on. It isn't even shapely, just a thick clutch of muscle, lopsided, mute. Still, I feel it inside, its cage sounding a dull tattoo. I want, I want, but I can't open it. There's no key. I can't wear it on my sleeve or tell you from the bottom of it how I feel. Here, it's all yours now, but you'll have to take me, too. All right. Very, very nice little poem. Do you see what Rita does here, doing here? She's taking the idea of the heart, and she's taking some of the most commonplace phrases that we use about the heart, right? Such as, well, let's begin. Uh, well, hearts are red, all right? And hearts are sweet, and we say things like, uh, my heart is melting with love for you, all right? Or my heart uh, is turning over. Or we talk about, don't we? Huh? Don't we talk about the broken heart? Or we talk about the hard heart, right? And so on. Well, she's taking phrases like this. Hearts feel pain, all right? Hearts yearn. And let's see, what's another one? A very common one. Um, where does it... Where's that one about... Uh, where, right. You wear your heart on your sleeve. Or you say something like, I love you from the bottom of my heart. Right? That expression there. Whoops. That's not what I wanted. I love you from the bottom of my heart. 
So that's what she's doing in this poem. She's taking all of these commonplace phrases that have to do with heart, and she's applying them, right? She's applying them to that lump of muscle that is the actual physical heart. And what does she end up by saying? All of these things are applied uh, metaphorically or fi figuratively, right, to the heart. The heart as sort of an instrument of feeling. And she's taking them and she's saying, well, really, this heart is inside my body. That is the physical heart. And so that would apply to the metaphorical heart also. She can't really open it, right? Because there's no key. Another phrase, the key to my heart, I'm going to give you the key to my heart. That's a metaphor, isn't it? But she's saying, look, my heart is in my chest. It's in my rib cage. I can't take it out and give it to you. You are going to have to take all of me, not just my heart. Neat little poem. But, of course, what we're talking about here uh, is form. So let's look at form. But before we do that, I want to point out something else, and that is context. Rita Dove, in her poem, we're going to be getting back to that at the end of this lecture, but Rita Dove, in her poem, is relying very, very much upon the reader's awareness of this language context. That is the language that we use when we talk about the heart, like wearing the heart on my sleeve, or I'm wearing my heart on my sleeve, or I'm giving you the key to my heart, or I feel things, I feel for you from the bottom of my heart, I sympathize from the bottom of my heart, and so on. She is, of course, depending upon that context, much more so than Robert Frost does in his poem. And this is something, as I say, we'll get back to at the end of the, of the lecture because this is another characteristic of uh, contemporary poetry. But as I say, we're looking at form here. Um, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to make this as brief as I can in the interest of time. But look at the absence of rhyme. No rhyme, no regular, and look at the short lines. Another characteristic of contemporary poetry, of the form of contemporary poetry, um, that comes in during the modern period, um, not at all common in poetry before the modern period, this the use of the short line. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, previous to the modern period, most poems are going to be at least six syllables. And usually, usually eight or ten. Read a dove. One, two, three, four syllables, two syllables, right? Four, two, and so on. Short lines, and the lines are not of any regular length. They're all relatively short, but there's no particular pattern to length. She doesn't go, say, I'm going to go four syllables, and then two syllables here, and so on, and then I'm going to repeat four and two. No. I'm going to keep my lines relatively short. And she is relying then not on a regular uh, line length, although it's going to be short. She's not relying on a regular line length, and she's not relying on any particular meter, such as the da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, that we saw with Robert Frost. She's relying instead on where she breaks the line. Right? So she decides here she's going to break it melt. Right? She decides here she's going to break it over. Right? She decides here she's going to break it harden. What is she doing here? 
She's breaking at the phrase. And these are all verbal phrases. Melt is a verb, turn over, break, harden. She's breaking at the ends of these verbal phrases. And that's, so that's, you know, that, that is the, the form, if you will, that she's using. Line break is crucial. Now this, I'm not saying that uh, we're moving from the regular line length to lines that always break at phrases. No, there are lots of different ways to break a line. My point is that in form, the contemporary poem tends to rely much more on the line break rather than on any particular line length such as the six-syllable line, eight-syllable, and so on. Please keep that in mind. So, no rhyme. Um, no regular meter. No regular stanza. You didn't see any <clears throat> particular stanza structure in Rita Dove's Heart to Heart, and so on. Let's move on to uh, our next... Where's the slideshow? Okay, here we are. Let's <clears throat> let's move on to the next characteristic, which is language. Contemporary poetry tends to use the language of the particular versus the general. It tends to use that second the shouldn't be there. It tends to use language that points to, to concrete things. And by concrete, we mean what we can see and touch, such as literal concrete, that concrete sidewalk outside your house. Okay, That's something that you can see and touch, right? Versus the abstract. Abstract um, nouns refer to things that you can't see or touch. So sidewalk would be an example of a concrete noun. It points to something that you can see and touch. Love would be an abstract noun. You can't actually see or touch love. It's not physical. right? It re it's, it's a word that refers to something very general and abstract. Finally, the language of contemporary poetry tends to be colloquial rather than formal. That is, it tends to be the language of everyday speech. Let's go and have a look at some poems that represent language here. We'll go back to our characteristics of contemporary poetry. And we're going to look at Let's see, Definition of a Stranger by Idra Novi and right, Grief Calls Us to the Things of This World. So, Definition of a Stranger by contemporary poet Idra Novi. Notice how it begins. Person not a member of a group. Remember what I said about syntax as a general characteristic of form? That Contemporary poetry will often not use conventional syntax, but instead will use a broken syntax or will use phrases instead of sentences. Well, that's what you have here right at the beginning of definition of a stranger. Person not a member of a group, right? No verb. It's just a noun phrase. Person not a member of a group. What is she doing? She's using the form of definitions as in dictionary definitions, right? This is the kind of language you would find if you went to a dictionary and you were looking up the word stranger. And you might see something in the form of person not a member of a group. Outside the group, right? A visitor, guest, or the breast that brushes your arm on the subway. Person with whom you've had no acquaintance, but who's taken your rocking chair from the curbside and curls up in it and closes her eyes. Now notice again what we said about form as well. No rhyme, 
right? No regular line length, no regular meter, no regular stanza structure, okay? Uh, and closes her eyes. Person in line behind you now waiting for a glass of water or of whiskey, of elixir. Person logging online at the same second from the Home Depot in Lima or in search of the Dalai Lama. Person not privy or party to a decision, edict, etc., but who's eaten from the same fork at the pizzeria and kissed your wilder sister on New Year's. Person assigned to feed the tiger at the zoo where you slipped your hand once into the palm of someone else's father. Well, there's a lot more going on in this poem than language, as you can tell. But a few things about language here. First of all, language of a dictionary, all right, which is unique. All right? This is not particularly expected. This is something that Idra Novi has done for this poem. The language that you would find in a dictionary, or the form of language you would find in a dictionary is not something that's going to be standard in poetry at all. It's something that she uses uh, in this particular poem. Person not a member of a group, a visitor, guest, or the breast that brushes your arm on the subway. Image of something ordinary, something common. Person with whom you've had no acquaintance, but who's taken your rocking chair. Rocking chair, concrete noun, curbside, concrete noun, right? Person in line behind you now. These are all common phrases. You might not, you might say, I don't get this poem. I don't know what the heck she's doing. But you recognize the language as the language of the ordinary. There's a person in line behind me, right? Glass of water. Okay? Person logging online. Very contemporary kind of language, isn't it? Okay? Like, I'm online now. Don't bother me. I'm checking my email. Okay? Home Depot. Reference to something very specific and concrete in our contemporary culture. But notice how she also mixes this ordinary colloquial language with some non-colloquial things, such as the word elixir. That's not an ordinary word. Water, whiskey, logging online, ordinary words, right? Curls up, ordinary phrase, curbside, chair, but then every now and then she sticks in a word like elixir that is unusual. Images from the ordinary, right? Forks at pizzeria, right? Somebody kissing your sister on New Year's Eve. Somebody feeding the tiger at the zoo, right? Um, and that wonderful image at the end, slipping your hand into somebody else's hand like you're watching those tigers and you're watching that man feeding those tigers and you're just a little kid right and you're thinking oh my goodness that's kind of frightening i'm standing here i'm only six years old and i see that great big tiger and that guy feeding him and so i'm a little frightened so i reach out for what i reach out for my daddy's hand because my daddy's taken me to the zoo but that wasn't my daddy standing next to me. That was somebody else. And so what is she doing? Each of these things is an image of a stranger. But notice at the end, that very, very intimate act of putting your hand into somebody else's hand. The act of something that you do with somebody close, somebody who's not a stranger, a friend, a lover, a brother, a sister, a parent, and so on, right? Nice little contrast at the end. The stranger is the person you thought was really your daddy, but wasn't your daddy after all. She's defining stranger, and she's using, of course, a lot of things here that we're not going into, um, but language of the ordinary, images of things that are not only concrete, but that... Um, but that are familiar to us, like that Home Depot, right? Like logging online. The language of the familiar, 
the colloquial, the everyday. Grief calls us to the things of this world by Sherman Alexi. Now, this is here as an example of the language of contemporary poetry for two reasons. Number one, because it's extremely colloquial. It's this, although it's a poem, a published poem, there is nothing formal at all about the language. This is the language that we would use if we're just talking to somebody in our own family, talking to our friends on the street, right, or at the Home Depot, that sort of thing, the ordinary language. Now, I have to warn you that uh, there are a couple of uh, taboo words in this poem, and I'm going to say them out loud. One is the S word, and the other is the F word. And I apologize if anybody's offended by this, but um, I'm going to be reading this poem, and I'm going to, in out of respect for Sherman Alexi, I am going to uh, say these words out loud. So if you want to turn the uh, lecture off or skip ahead at this point, feel free to do so. Um, grief calls us to the things of this world. And Sherman Alexi is alluding to a poem by Richard Wilbur, written maybe about 50 years or so uh, before this particular poem, um, called Love Calls Us to the Things of This World. And the morning air is all awash with angels, is from the early part of that poem. All right, so Sherman Alexie picking up on the very first line of Wilbur's poem, uh, the eyes open, that's the, that's the way Wilbur's poem uh, begins. He writes, the eyes open to a blue telephone in the bathroom of this five-star hotel. I wonder whom I should call, a plumber, proctologist, urologist, or priest? Who is blessed among us and most deserves the first call? I choose my father because he's astounded by bathroom telephones. I dial home. And, of course, here's, here begins our really colloquial conversation, right? I said the language that we'd use in conversation with somebody else. My mother answers. Hey, Ma! I say, can I talk to Papa? She gasps. And then I remember that my father has been dead for nearly a year. Shit, Mom. I say, I forgot he's dead. I'm sorry. How did I forget? It's okay, she says. I made him a cup of instant coffee this morning and left it on the table. Like I have for, what, 27 years? And I didn't realize my mistake until this afternoon. My mother laughs at the angels who wait for us to pause during the most ordinary of days and sing our praise to forgetfulness before they slap our souls with their cold wings. Those angels burden and unbalance us. Those fucking angels ride us piggyback. Those angels, forever falling, snare us and haul us, pray and praying, into dust. Now, I'm going to uh, wrap this up now. We're going to divide this lecture into two parts because obviously... I can't cover this in uh, the time I usually allot myself, and I try to uh, I try to allot myself no more than 30 minutes per lecture, and we're now almost up at 40. So what we're going to do is uh, we'll continue this lecture in a second part, and I will conclude just by summarizing what I'm saying about language. Now, I mentioned. Sherman Alexie's use of the colloquial, ordinary, everyday language. Also, his use of taboo words, like the S word and the F word and so on. Now, both of these are characteristic of the language of contemporary poetry. That is, colloquial language, ordinary, everyday language. But you will have noticed, if you were paying attention, that not all of the language in this poem is of that kind because he mixes doesn't doesn't he especially at the end when he starts talking about the angels the language 
start to become more formal, especially in this last stanza. It starts up here, right? The angels who wait for us to pause during the most ordinary of days. Right? We're talking about ordinary language, but that's not a particularly ordinary phrase. Sing praise to our forgetfulness. The language here is getting a little more elevated. And then finally at the end, angels forever falling, snare us and haul us pray and praying into dust. So he's mixing the colloquial, the vernacular, uh, with some more formal language. And you'll find that too. All right. The mixing of styles. Sherman Alexie mixes language style. Doesn't he? The formal with the informal, the colloquial with the more elevated, and so on. Finally, before I turn this lecture off, notice something else here. And maybe you did, and good for you if you noticed. But we were talking about stanza structure. Notice how this poem, for all of its informality of language, is divided very, very formally and regularly into stanzas of two lines, right? Two, two. Two. And remember what I said that at, right at the beginning, my warning that not everything I say about the structure or the language or anything about contemporary poetry is going to apply to every single poem you see. There's going to be great variety. Um, and remember, when we look at contemporary poetry, that there is that great variety, so it's very difficult to reduce the characteristics of contemporary poetry into any one particular list. So we're going to call that part one. Thank you for listening to part one, and we will continue with the rest of the lecture in part two.